Tell me if this sounds familiar. You're a new maker and you are just getting into the world of making emulsions, lotions, creams, and all kinds of emulsified goodness. You're doing your research and you come across a lot of conflicting advice. One source will say something is super important and another source won't mention it at all. What's true, what's a myth, and where do you start? That's what we are tackling today. Hey bees, I'm Marie from Humble Bee and Me, and today I wanted to debunk six lotion making myths that you might have come across in your lotiony research. Some of these myths are just flat out wrong, while some of them are useful in some situations but aren't universal rules, though sometimes people think they are. Before we dive into the myths, I have a few caveats. The first one is it depends. The emulsifier that you're using and the overall formulation that you are working with really impacts the emulsion and the needs of that formulation to succeed. Some emulsifiers are pickier than others, some formulations are more challenging than others, and so some formulations will have different requirements than others. I also really want to encourage you to try things before you write them off. Something that works for one formulation might not work for another, so if you haven't had success with something in the past, but you're seeing somebody else saying that they've had success with it somewhere else, give it a go their way and see what happens. And lastly, always make sure you are researching your ingredients. The Humble Bee and Me Encyclopedia is a great free resource for this and I have also shared two full blog posts on how to research your ingredients, a part one and a part two. So make sure you are reading through those posts to really hone your ingredient research skills. The partner blog post for this video contains a lot of helpful links to further resources and readings so make sure you are checking that out as well if you would like to learn more. But let's get debunking! Myth number one is that you can change the type of emulsion you're making by changing the phase sizes or the pouring order. When you emulsify oil and water together, very generally speaking, you are either making an oil and water emulsion or a water and oil emulsion. There are other types of emulsion, but I am trying to keep this simple. Oil in water emulsions are a lot more common than water in oil emulsions. In an oil in water emulsion, the oil is the inner phase, while the water is the outer phase or the continuous phase. The inner phase, the oil phase, is sequestered away inside my cells which are bopping about in that outer phase, the water phase. Lab Muffin has a really helpful article with some great diagrams on this that's linked in the blog post if you want to learn more. The type of emulsion you'll get, so which phase is sequestered away inside of my cell and which phase is the outer and continuous phase, is entirely determined by the emulsifier that you use. Some emulsifiers will want to gather up all the oil in the formulation and sequester it away inside of my cell, while others are out there looking for the water to sequester away into a my cell, well, leave the oil out there to do its thing. Because the type of emulsion you get is entirely determined by the emulsifier that you use, nothing you do in changing phase sizes or in manufacturing will change the type of emulsion you'll get because it's determined by the emulsifier. Of course, changing your phase sizes and changing your manufacturing method can definitely impact your formulation, but it's not going to give you an oil in water emulsion if you are using a water in oil emulsifier or vice versa. To learn even more, Skin Chakra has a fabulous post on this that is linked in the partner blog post. Myth number two is related to our first myth, and it is if you are making an oil in water emulsion, then you must pour the oil phase into the water phase when combining the heated phases in order for the emulsion to succeed. Specific emulsifiers can definitely have requirements about which phase is poured into which, but you can't determine that simply by knowing what type of an emulsion an emulsifier creates. You will have to research each of your emulsifiers individually to know this. In my experience, for many of the emulsifiers I work with, emulsifiers like Olive M1000, Glycerol Stearate and PEG100 Stearate, Emulsifying Wax NF, Glycerol Stearate SE, it doesn't really matter. These are all oil and water emulsifiers and more often than not I pour the water phase into the oil phase and this has never caused me any issues. I've also found sample formulations from suppliers and the manufacturers of these emulsifiers and the instructions can go either way depending on what the formulation is for and how it's structured and probably on who wrote it. There are definitely cases where it does matter, for instance if you are working with sucrogel or making a beeswax borax emulsion, but yeah, knowing the type of emulsion that you are making doesn't necessarily dictate which beaker gets poured into which. If you'd like to learn more about the differences between oil in water and water in oil emulsions, Skin Chakra wrote a whole post about it that's super helpful and enlightening. It is also linked in the partner blog post. Myth number three is that you have to heat and hold when you make an 
emulsion. Heating and holding is the process of bringing both of the heated phases of your emulsion to 70 degrees Celsius and holding them at that temperature for 20 minutes before proceeding with your emulsion. Of course, this is irrelevant if you are making a cold processed emulsion where nothing needs to be heated up in the first place. Heat and hold is something I have never done, at least not intentionally, and I have made hundreds and hundreds of emulsions in the last decade plus that I've been emulsifying. In my experience, heating the two phases so that they are pretty close to the same temperature and everything in the oil phase that needs to melt has melted is perfectly fine. This is generally what is called for in supplier and manufacturer formulations as well. Their instructions usually read something like combine phase A and heat to 70 to 80 degrees Celsius. Combine phase B and heat to 70 to 80 degrees Celsius. Combine phases A and B and homogenize or blend. There's no mention of a time to hold them at this temperature. It's really just about getting them both up to the same-ish temperature where the oil phase has melted and then carry on. Sometimes I'll need to give the heated oil phase a bit of an extra boost because something won't melt. That something is usually a cationic ingredient like BTMS 50. And so then the oil phase does end up being a bit hotter than the water phase. But as long as the water phase is hot enough that the oil phase doesn't like seize up and solidify on you when you add the water to the oil phase, it works. So yeah, don't worry too much about having a thermometer or a timer as long as they're pretty close to the same temperature and everything in the oil phase has melted, you're good to go. Myth number four is that glycerin is insanely sticky and if you use even just a little bit too much of it, it can make your entire product unusably tacky. Perceptions of and opinions about stickiness and tackiness and what's sticky and what's not are really, really personal. I really encourage you to try it and see what you think. What does your skin think? What is your skin like? I spent years assuming anything with more than about 5% glycerin would be just unusably tacky until I bought and tried a La Roche-Posay lotion that used 30% vegetable glycerin. It said that right on the label. So I tried making my own and I ended up loving that as well. And ever since I have used a lot more than 5% glycerin in a lot of my formulations. It's definitely not for everyone, but I have received a lot of really positive feedback about that dupe formulation I shared. So I'm definitely not alone in this. If you've got really dry skin and you're feeling a little adventurous, try that 30% glycerin formulation. I'll link to it in the description box below. Myth number five is that you have to use a high powered or high shear blender or homogenizer to make emulsions. This is one of those it depends myths. There are definitely some formulations and some emulsions that need it. There are some that don't need it, but definitely benefit from it. And there are some where you can absolutely just hand whisk that bad boy and it'll be fine. It really depends on the formulation. I usually prefer to use an immersion blender when I am making emulsions, but if you're a new maker and you don't have one yet, don't feel like not having one means you can't make emulsions. As a formulator, it's a good idea to get a few for what will help an emulsion form and what can make life a bit harder for an emulsion. High shear mixing usually helps an emulsion. So if you are working with a formulation that has a few challenging elements in it, say it's got a very high electrolyte load or perhaps the viscosity is very, very thin, then you might end up needing that high shear mixing to push that emulsion to success. Conversely, if the formulation you're working with was really quite thick or had a pretty darn low electrolyte load, you might not need that high shear mixing in order to make things happy, creamy, lovely and great. As always, it comes down to researching your ingredients, look at supplier formulations, see what they've spelled out in their instructions, and then just try it and see what happens. You might be very pleasantly surprised, you might end up throwing a few things away, but either way, you'll learn something. And then our last myth is that you have to heat your heated oil phase and your heated water phase separately. This is another sometimes but not always myth. I have made many successful emulsions by just heating all of the heated phase ingredients together in the same beaker or even a, just a saucepan over low heat and then just whisking until cool. I've even found formulations from suppliers that do this. I link to one in the partner blog post that's from Hallstar and it uses all of M1000 and they basically just add cold all of M1000 to some hot water and then homogenize and mix until uniform. This won't work with every emulsifier and it also won't work if there are ingredients in your oil phase that need to be heated up higher than the boiling point of water in order to melt. Beyond that, feel free to just play with this and see what happens and see what you think. If you're new to making lotion and are looking for a fantastic place to start, I highly recommend this formulation or this one if you're looking for something all natural. Thanks so much for watching. Please read that partner blog post and I'll see you next time. Bye.